if some loud noise happened behind us and I totally flinched, you would flinch. Totally. Not even if you didn't hear the noise. So like, let's say it wasn't a noise oh, that we yeah, both you, heard, right? Like if yeah. I flinched with no cue to you that something was going on, my flinching would make you flinch, right? Because we're your amygdala would see my my threat response mm. and it would cue up a threat response. Like we're always, we are interconnected human beings. Like as a species, we use these cues to know how safe or dangerous the environment is. An entrepreneur straight out of New York City, Michael Chernow was cracking. What up, everybody? Welcome back to the Creatures Habit Pod. I have a guest that is coming on for the second time, Dr. Sarah Bren. She is a clinical psychologist, and she is um, she really focuses on parenting. We had her on the show a couple of months back, and I loved it so much, and I got such great feedback from it. And when she was on the show, I kind of had a feeling that that was going to happen. So we had already said, I was like, hey, like we got to come back. I hope Sarah you know, becomes a, a regular on the show because I feel like parenting, at least relevancy in my life, and as you know, like authenticity is everything. I really do like to share relevance in my life with you guys. Um, I'm like deep in the throes of parenting, (laughs) deep in the throes, two boys that are eight and six and my like life is trying to create awesomeness for them. Like I really do want to do that. And that, you know, as you guys know, also, if you've been following my content, that doesn't mean that I put them before my, before me, I actually put me before them so that I can be well enough to actually provide and, and be the dude that I want to be for them because I'm not thinking about what I haven't done for myself yet. Um, I think that's a big, important thing to point out, but, um, doc, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we talked about a lot on your first appearance on the creatures of habit pod and coming into this one, I wanted to get a little bit more specific and sort of think through like some of the things that I think, especially now with like this episode will air in January in the new year. So we're right before the new year now, Mm -hmm. but like this is holiday time. This is awesome, cozy time, but it's also like pretty stressful time, right? Oh yeah. Like how do you, as a, as a, as a therapist and, and someone that works with, you know, Lots of people, but but parents. What what it, like? Do you see stress levels sort of increase around these times? Oh yeah. So for so many reasons, but like, I think for parents, one like our routines get shaken up in the holidays, which may, means our kids are like, you know, shake it up. I always say like big transitions are like a snow globe. Like when you shake it, the snow is just everywhere. All the snow is disrupted. Mm-hmm. And it takes a while for everything to settle back down. And so it's like the tr- the holidays are shake the snow globe. Everything, sleep gets disrupted. Eating gets disrupted. Like all these like routines that we like to have settled. Like we were talking about this in the last episode, right? Like kids do like routine. Some kids need it more than others. But like we all like to know what's coming next, right? Mm-hmm. It helps us feel certainty, calmer. And the holidays mess with that. Mm. So anything that messes with our kids' routine is going to stress us out as parents because then we have to, we just feel disjointed as well. Plus, I don't know about you, but like many people that I talk with, like the holidays also amp up family drama. They amp up expectations. More people in our business having opinions about how we raise our kids. More people watching us raising our kids. And it, that can be really stressful on parents mm. too. Yeah, I, I got to say that, you know, there's never been a, a, a churn out get together without a <laughs> healthy dose of drama. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it just since I'm since I'm a, I'm, I'm a wee lad, there's, <laughs> there's been there's been some moments that are just totally memorable for the rest of my life branded into my brain. Yeah. And others not as bad. Um, but yes, the drama level definitely increases around the holidays for mm-hmm. for 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 the family. But there's also a lot of amazing moments. You know, I, I, one of the things that I really wanted to touch upon is traveling parents, parents that have yeah. to travel for work mm-hmm. and how that potentially could impact a relationship with a child or yeah. is a lot of this, you know, I, I, I'm using myself in as, as an example here. So I don't travel a ton, but mm-hmm. I'm definitely on an airplane twice a month mm-hmm. and for, you know, 
three to th- two to four days at a time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would say every, almost once a week, I'm, 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 I'm not at home for one or two nights. Yeah. And so that makes me feel potentially not all the time, but if it's longer, like I was just down in Austin for work, I got mm-hmm. back last night, I had dinner and breakfast with the kids, I had to get right back down to the city, I know I'm here, I'm do my very best to get home for dinner tonight, but chances are I won't. Yeah. And so, like, I just quite, I just wanted to ask you from your experience, like, how does, how does a, a traveling parent, what is the impact on children? Yeah, well, and people who, hear me talk about parenting get frustrated because I say this all the time, but it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And I think that's a really important just thing to hold on to as a parent because the reality is, is like there's a lot of things that we don't get a say in and it really doesn't matter what it is, right? Maybe I have to travel a lot for work. Maybe it's, you know, I, I'm sick or maybe, who knows? There's a lot of things that can disrupt, right? Or cause us to have to separate from our kids sometimes. And I think how we do that is much more important than whether or not we do it. Because the reality is separations in and of itself isn't the thing that makes or breaks attachment. Mm -hmm. It's the way that we separate and how we reunite after we separate that's far more important and impactful. So I just feel like that's important to just give parents a dose of like relief and ease that like it's really common I think to feel nervous or anxious like, oh my gosh, is this going to mess up my relationship with my kid? Am I doing something that's going to damage my relationship. And like, I feel like we can ask that question a thousand times a day as parents. And like, most important is like, our attachment's not that fragile. Like, it's a really robust, strong system. It's built to last, right? Like, human species, our attachment systems are very strong, right? We've, it's evolved for many, many years. This is biological, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But I do think how you do it matters. And there are ways to kind of think about it that can set your kid and yourself up for a little more success. Um, Because yeah, I think if we're constantly separating from our kids and we're not helping them prepare for that and process that, um, have a narrative about that, understand that that's what that means for our family, then they don't always know what to do with that and they fill in blanks or, you know, they fill in the blanks like, Mm. oh, they don't wanna be with me or we're not that important. Even if those are unconscious thoughts, right? or just having to like miss a parent without having a way to talk about that, right? So one is give ourselves a little bit of a break. Mm-hmm. I love what you said about the attachment thing though. I actually never really thought about that, like how strong the attachment system really is, mm-hmm. right? Like we think that it's like, oh gosh, you know, we're not around for a week, you know, for five days, like they're gonna, but realistically, there's like a biological attachment. They have our Mm. genes actually. Yeah, and they're really hardwired to wanna be with you, which can make us feel very guilty because Mm. when we separate, they're gonna have a strong reaction to that. It makes sense and it's appropriate and healthy for a kid to be upset about us leaving. As parents, we then internalize that as like us hurting our kids and then we feel guilty and like obviously, we don't wanna like cause undue distress. And when we do cause distress, even if it's healthy, appropriate distress, right? A kid getting distressed about a separation is appropriate. That means we have a good, solid, Mm -hmm. strong attachment. Mm -hmm. But we wanna help them make sense of that distress. So when I say like, how do you help prepare a kid for travel? One, you you wanna talk about it, right? Let them know what's coming. But also you wanna talk about it in a way that it's like this balancing act. On the one hand, you don't wanna like overdo it and make them anxious. But on the other hand, you also want to do it in a way that they can understand. So you kind of developmentally want to hit the mark, right? If you have really young kids, this abstract idea of like, well, dad's going to be on a business trip. Like, they don't really know what that means. That's Mm -hmm. abstract. How do we concretize that for them? How do we show them what that means? Can we show them pictures of where we're going to be? Can we point it out on a map? Can we give them a way to picture it in their minds, right? Can we create like a visual calendar, like with pictures? Mm. Like a sun and a moon, like I'm gonna be gone this morning, these mornings and these nights, and I'll be back and then a, you know, a picture of me or like a drawing of, a, of you, right? Mm-hmm. So like some way for them to literally track it in a more concrete way because kids don't really have that great of a sense of time and days and what it means to be gone. So helping them kind of make this abstract thing more concrete, super helpful, helping them 
the other thing is like developmentally, kids, your, your kids age probably can do this, but much younger kids really have a hard time kind of conjuring up an internalized representation of us in their minds, mm -hmm. right? Like the object permanent and stuff. Like when you're gone, I can't, it's hard for me to like think of you and have that soothe me. So how do we help younger kids kind of have a, a representational object, a transitional object, something that helps them think of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work with some families who, I have a family that I had worked with for a while where the dad, they had moved from um, Philly to New York, but the dad still worked in Philly. And so this kid was contending with a new move, new house, new no school, dad. but dad was also just not around as much anymore. And so we talked about like, how do we have him have something that like represents dad that's easier for him to like soothe himself when he's missing dad, right? It's not a replacement, but mm -hmm. it, it's something, right? Like, can we have like a teddy bear where you record your voice in it or your a t-shirt you wear? Or like a lot of times I'll have parents create a book, the story of the move or the story of dad's work and like, so they can talk about it, tell the story. A narrative that helps us explain what we're experiencing is so important for everybody. Mm -hmm. Think about any time you've done therapy, like it's you tell the story, you kind of try to put all this stuff into a coherent narrative for ourselves that helps us make sense of things. Let's do that for little kids with like a story, a book, something they can revisit that helps them kind of, because they like to revisit it over and over and over and over again. They do, mm -hmm. they do. I, um, yeah, it's probably it's probably not the greatest thing, but whenever I come home from a trip, mm -hmm. if it's more than is it like today, I'm not gonna do it because that would be ridiculous if I bought them something every time I went away on a day trip. But when I go on like a trip that's longer than two or three days, mm -hmm. I tend to come home with a t with a little little teddy. Mm -hmm. My both of my kids, they really just love teddy bears. That's They're like awesome. teddy bears, teddy bears. So whenever I'm like you know somewhere, I see something, I grab them a little teddy bear. And they love that. So when I come home, I give them, I give them a little teddy bear. It caught, it's like a five or ten dollar thing, right? Yeah. So it's not nothing, but it's it's not like crazy expensive. I'm not like right. spoiling the daylights out of these kids of when they come home from a trip. But it's been something that I think has been kind of like for me a way to just feel like, all right, I'm gonna come home and we're gonna have this moment. And um you're right. Like the truth is, I, I I do feel guilty when I'm away. Like mm -hmm. I do. I feel guilty, and like we Facetime every day. And there's something about it that, like, you know. Also, my wife, my wife is is at home with them, so she just has this like amazing bond like already right mm -hmm. and so when i'm traveling i'm like oh man and so i just I, I figured it would be a good thing to talk about because i know a lot of people you know travel a lot for work and it's yeah. hard to especially in like this remote world now where like a lot of companies that are remote are doing like off sites and they're like yeah. you know they're you know people are all over the place and you know companies do need to get together and have facetime too so mm -hmm. I just wanted to get some 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 things that, and I love like sort of creating a visual map for them, or like creating yeah. something where you're not just saying, "Oh, you know, Daddy's going on a trip for work." It's more like, "Let me talk to you about what I'm actually going to be doing." You know, yeah. Let me explain to you so like I'm I'm um, including you in this in this thing, so that you don't feel like it's Daddy's thing and not the family's thing. Right, and the beautiful thing is, I think. You said this at the very beginning, like you put yourself first. You are trying to do things that help you kind of reach your sort of self-actualization. And through that process, you're going to be the best dad you can be for your kids. Making that explicit to our kids is a huge gift, right? Showing them how we do that, mm -hmm. modeling that. So it's not just that I'm doing it, but I'm also talking to you about how I'm doing it. Hey, this is something I care a lot about. I'm building this thing and it's cool. You want to know about it? Like, how do I include you in this process? How do I invite you into my world? And like, that's a huge gift for kids. And that helps them feel connected to us even when we're away, mm -hmm. right? And they get to see like, oh yeah, my dad or my mom like does cool stuff and like cares about stuff and like has interests and has skills. And I want to be like that one day, you know? That's a really cool thing to model for our kids. What do you, um, 
something happened recently where uh, both both my boys towards the end of November were writing their Santa lists and they um, and it made me feel so good but also kind of like a little like how am I going to navigate this and that's why I wanted to talk to you about this as well because I also have friends who take their children individually on trips Mm -hmm. and so Finn my older son said what I want for for Christmas is I want to go to a concert with dad and and then maybe take a trip with dad alone and Mm -hmm. I was like all right. I was like, I could do that, you yeah. know. But I felt bad because my younger son Dakota was sitting right there next to him. And so you know, like mm-hmm. what what do you think the like what's a way to navigate that? You know, yeah. where you spend time not necessarily with both kids, but you're they're they're coming to they're 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 approaching an age where you could totally have an individual experience or an individualized relationship with both mm-hmm. of your children. Yeah, which I actually think is super healthy and great, and like special, and like doesn't have to be identical either, because your kids aren't identical, right? Like they have different interests, they want to do different things with you. I would imagine, um, you know. I think, and I hear you. It's like, ooh, I'm. Am I gonna, you know, make this other child feel left out if I do something special with with the other child? And I think you could talk about that, right? You could say like, okay, I could do this with you. And then Dakota, what would you like to do? Like, kind of name it. Like, the thing is one on one time with Dad. How do they want to spend that? What mm-hmm. would their dream day with you look like, right? But I think one on one time is great with kids. But first of all, I think one on one time. You know, I think the research really shows that parental one-on-one time with kids, especially when there's many siblings in the family, right, like actually is really important because it builds like, it builds language development, it builds self-esteem, it builds um, like social emotional skills, it builds self-regulation skills. Like having one-on-one time with a, you know, primary attachment figure is really important and it's valuable. So there's like the one question is like, how do we make it feel fair to everybody? Hmm. Like, how do we talk about that? And like, I think fairness, I was going to say, I think fairness is overrated. It kind of is. But like, I don't mean it like things shouldn't feel fair. But we also can help our kids tolerate when things don't feel identical. Mm -hmm. You know, like I always kind of tell my kids, fair is not everybody getting the exact same thing. Fair is everybody getting what they need to feel good. Mm. Um, and that mm. might look different for different kids in the same family. And that's, I think, a good message to help kids hear, right? Because, you know, you don't, maybe going on a concert makes sense for your older child. Maybe that would be really overwhelming for your younger child. And that just because you're doing it with one doesn't mean you should do it with the other. So mm-hmm. it's like, you kind of have to make it fit each kid. And I think that's okay to say that out loud. Like, there's going to be different things that we do because that's, you know, where we're at. I, I, I'm, it's like, it's definitely an, uh, an exciting opportunity because it doesn't, mm-hmm. it hasn't really like, neither one of them have said to me very specifically, I want you alone. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, so it's kind of cool to get to have that. You know, the other thing that's a little bit challenging, and, and I'm sure that this is, you know, a lot of other families can, can identify during the week, it's week, you know, the kids are in school, you know. I'm working, Donna's, Donna's working, and, um, you know, we have the same routine every night, Monday through Thursday, really. It's mm-hmm. the same routine. It's like, I get home from school, I get home from work, we all have dinner, we hang out as a family, we play games, um, and then they go to bed at like 7.30. And then Donna and I hang out, we watch a, a show, and we're in bed by 9, 9.30. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like our routine, right? Super happy, simple, easy, I love it, you know. The dogs are involved too. The dogs get taken out on walks and whatnot. During the weekend, the truth is, is that like we love being together as a family, mm-hmm. like all together all the time, right? Like it's like we, <laughs> it's yeah. like outside of Donna going to the horse and, and 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 riding her horse or me working out in the morning and getting my workout in, we're just together, mm-hmm. right? It's not like oh, mom's gonna be with the kids or dad's gonna be with the kids. Yeah, and. Like, I'm wondering if I should start incorporating some of that. Because, I, I mean, the truth is, is that, like, I would much rather be a unit and together because we love hanging out so much yeah. than separate it. But is there is there a time where parent should say, okay, I'm going to be with the kids 
for you know three four hours and you do what you want to do i'll take i'm going to take the kids i mean i don't think there's like a should or shouldn't right like if it works for your family and you guys enjoy being together and you aren't i mean a lot of times the reasons why we split off is out of necessity right like ugh, you got a birthday party and you gotta we gotta go do this and i gotta go run to the grocery store and like we live these busy lives and so a lot of times like our lives dictate who's spending time with who. See, it's so crazy because I, I mean, I, I mean, and, and maybe it's just because I, I don't know, but like, it's not like that for us. Like, That's amazing. We, if we never split it up, <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's like we really don't. Like, we we both go to the birthday parties. We both go to the sports. We both go to the karate. We 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 just do. And yeah. so, and I think that that is awesome. But I also think that there's like. You know, there should. I'm. I'm just thinking to myself, like, should there be a, a, an opportunity to give my wife, like, hey, take the afternoon alone, and I'm. I because I really think that I need to start developing more, a more intimate relationship with these dudes as they as they mm-hmm. start to grow. Well, have you asked your wife? Does do you want to take a couple hours? I to have. Go do your thing? I have, and and it's like she's. Well, typically it's, it's it's she's gonna go to the horse. So yeah. if she goes horseback riding, it's when I work out. So the kids will actually on the weekends they get a little TV. So we'll give them some TV yeah. for about an hour and a half. I'll work out. She goes to the horse, and then we're back together. <laughs> okay. So that that works. It works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But I hear what you're saying, right? If uh, is there a benefit to cr- like carving out intentional one on one time with my kids? And like, sure. Yeah, I think there can be. But I don't even think it has to be like, you know, to your point, like maybe it's not necessarily you asking your wife if she wants to go do something, but maybe it's, I'm going to go take Dakota to do this thing. Or honestly, like I have to do, I also really think we underestimate how much kids want to be a part of our like boring life. (laughs) Like, like I have to go to the grocery store. Do you want to come with me Mm -hmm. and help me pick out? what we need for the week like or like I need to fix something in the garage like can you just help me can you be my tool buddy like and hand me the things like or I have to fold laundry (laughs) like do you want to help me do you want to hang with me while I fold it like kids like to be involved in our mundane tasks I think if they're older and you've never asked them to they're going to be like I don't want to fold socks but you can make it more fun if they're Mm -hmm. really little give them socks to fold. They will love it. They will feel so invited, right? Um, so that's one thing I think. It doesn't need to be like a concert. That's awesome. But it doesn't have to be that every time. It can literally just be like, you know, I want to work on this thing. You want to help me do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you might find that you have two boys who want both want to help you. And that's fine. But you could also like, if one of them has an interest and you see something that's related to that that they might really enjoy, you could just take them. And that could be a cool experience. It's I think it makes memories and it's it's nice to spend one-on-one time with our kids. And they don't have to share you, which is really cool for them, right? They don't have to share you with their sibling. They get to just have your undivided attention, which I think is like if you are going to have one-on-one time with, a, with one of your kids, like mm-hmm. really – make that like weighted like let that fill them up in a big way like maybe be intentional about it like be present do not take your phone it's just gonna say like put your phone away Don't, yes like maximize the value of that for them you know be there and it doesn't have to be something incredibly elaborate either like really don't underestimate the value of just like Time Going present to with our kids. Yeah. Asking them about their debt, you know, be <laughs> there to like let them be like they're the star of the show. I want. Yeah. I mean, I've just yeah. I've said it. I've said it so many times because I just. So I had I, I want to share an experience that was really sort of groundbreaking for me that I had last week mm-hmm. on. uh Thursday. I went to I went to Austin on Friday. I had this experience Thursday. So I in October went down to Georgia for this event called Running Man. And it was like a it was like a spoof on Burning Man. Okay. And it was like a fitness festival that this guy Jesse Itzler and Devin Levesque threw. So 
one of the best events I've ever been to, straight up. It was like an unbelievable event. It was like everything that I enjoy in my life in the world of wellness, like all in one place with like a thousand of like the most of like the best intentioned people. Everybody was like there for That's the right so reason. Cool. It was like a harmony of happiness. <laughs> it was like so good. <laughs> Sounds awesome. It was so good. It was so good. And it was it was the whole thing was centered in this uh, like abandoned mile loop horse track. So the track was a perfect mile. And when you sign up for the event, you sign up for a certain distance that you're going to run. It was like the event was Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And so you sign up for a distance and, you know, you commit to doing that distance, whatever. And then, in you know, but all, all, the, all the while, you know, people are running, there's – the, the world's largest sauna they built they built they, there was like 40 cold plunges there was a tractor trailer that they turned into like a freezer that you can go in there and get like cold exposure that way there was breath work and yoga and 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 speakers and breakouts and like all sorts of cool shit so you could like run a mile sit in a sauna for a half an hour do a cold plunge run two miles go do some breath work and some stretching run another mile so like it was a 10 hour period of time that you mm -hmm. can just run as much as you want no pressure running chilling eating ex like just it was just this kind of crazy thing so if you're not like you know people listening if it's if you're not a fitness person that might not sound like the best time i'm not a fitness person and it sounds like the best time it was <laughs> such a good time because i signed up and i'm not like a long distance runner anymore i used to run long distance i signed up for i think uh, a 10k which is like seven miles and i ran 15. And, and like pretty much everybody was just like, this is amazing. Like people are just running and talking and having great conversations and like running slow, no pressure, going to the sauna. It was just, it was wonderful. And the people there were wonderful. But I did breath work there and I had done a bunch of breath work throughout my life mm -hmm. um, or at least in the last whatever, 19 years. Um, I had never done this kind of breath work and I had no idea what I was walking into, but it was like outer body experience type breath really? work. It was like 30 minutes called holotropic breathing. It was this guy, Mike Gazzo. I, I think I've mentioned him on the podcast before, but if I haven't, we, we will definitely link to his stuff on the show notes. Anyway, we did this breath work and I had an, an emotional explosion. Like I had not had an mm. emotional, you know, exp like, I literally had a release that I hadn't felt since I was a kid, wow. I don't think. Yeah. And it was uncontrollable. My body was like, I felt like I was like legit levitating. My, my hands seized up. My mouth was just the breath and the introduction of like an enormous amount of oxygen really, really shook the tree of my soul. And I'm not a woo woo guy, but mm -hmm. I was, I was a woo woo guy then. Yeah. And I, I like cried like enormously for, for 45 minutes. Wow. And then I talked to Mike about the experience. He was like, come back tomorrow. We're doing it again. I went back the next day and I had the exact same experience, except this time I wasn't when, when the physical stuff started happening to me, I was terrified because like my hands literally like after 10 minutes, my hands started to like seize and I couldn't move them mm. and my mouth closed up like this. So I was like, you know, it was wow. like very weird. I couldn't feel my core. The top of my head felt numb. I thought I was having a heart attack. No one explained to me that this could happen. And it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. Uh, so he ran over to me when, I, when he saw, like, how scared I was, and he, like, walked me through it, and he was like, this is just your, your body. This is energy. Like, I could feel mm -hmm. your body pulsating. This is energy in your body that just needs to be released. And so just, like, breathe into it. Breathe heavier. Just remember, it's only oxygen. Like, you did not do anything else to your body. Yeah. And so I just kept breathing into it, and, you know um, – Anyway, I had, had an experience the next day. I wasn't afraid of the physical component of it, although it happened pretty quickly, faster this time than the last time. And I was getting like all these kind of crazy signs and I was having like these like amazing sort of breakthroughs. And then I did it again with him virtually on Thursday last week. And I didn't think that I was gonna have the same experience virtually. I, Cause I felt like, oh, you know, we were out there. I was really just sort of relaxed and stress-free. And, and this one I did on the floor of my office. Mm -hmm. And he had asked me like what my intention was for it. And I said, I just want to dig deeper. That's it. Like I haven't experienced anything like this before. So I really want to kind of dive into it and see if we can like what, what else I can learn, you know, about yeah. myself that I just don't know. And immediately once we started breathing, the thought came to mind that the love that I've always wanted that I never got was the love for my dad. 
the love and the approval from my father. Mm -hmm. And he's dead. And I never really felt like I had gotten that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's crazy to say, but like 10 minutes into that, thinking that, I was obviously sobbing, crying. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just like, it was like, again, like an emotional sort of like roller coaster. But then I had this vision of my father, like in present day, kneeling down next to me and and like rubbing my head and not saying anything, but expressing like real love for me. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I, I just couldn't believe it because I felt so real. It felt yeah. so real. And anyway, what, what, it, what I think, you know, I know that my boys, my sons and every child on the planet really they want like one thing and that's the love and, and attention and care from their parents they want that so bad more than anything mm -hmm. on the planet like my i know that i know it to be true because it is like it's something that sort of like plagued me for my life that i yeah. didn't feel like i got that from my father yeah and so anybody listening you know i'm just here to say that like if you do nothing else right like pay attention to your kids, you know? And then what, mm -hmm. what made me think about bringing this up, and I know that I'm speaking a lot and I'll shut the hell up in a second, is that my, my older son, when he starts telling a story, <laughs> I mean, it could, be like a half, <laughs> it could be like a half hour, Yeah, you know? Like he'll start, he'll come up to me and he's telling me about something that happened in school. And I like, he'll go on and I'll look at Donna and she'll look at me and I'm like, yo, this is one of them. And he just goes and goes and I know I know that he's so excited that I'm sitting there engaged with him telling me this story. Every mm -hmm. tiny little detail he says, you know, and it's the million dollar check for them. You know, yeah. it's the it's the it's like what we think the big thing is going to do for us in terms of our happiness barometer. That is it for them. It is. It is. And it's so foundational in their development. Right. This idea that like my dad is reflecting back to me who I am. And right now he's reflecting back to me that I'm an interesting person who he has time for and he cares to listen to. And that's going to translate internally into my sense of self. I am an interesting person who has something to share and people will listen when I talk because it matters. So that's that million dollar check, right? Getting actually cashed. It, it's what we want for our kids. You ask any parent, what do you want? What is your goal in parenting? Well, it's to raise a kid who feels happy and healthy and can have good relationships and can succeed in life. Maybe throw in a handful of other things, but that's the core. Mm -hmm. So what are you reflecting back to them that's going to allow them to actually believe that that's a possibility to achieve that narrative? It's listening to them when they tell a 30 minute story. And you can't listen to every 30 minute story. <laughs> Right? You can't. And it's okay to be able to say to our kids, oh, this is such an interesting story, but I, you know what? I got to go do this thing. Can we pause here? And can you try to remember where we ended? And I'm going to try to remember. I want to hear the rest of this, but I got to go do this thing now. So it's like we can be real people with real responsibilities and have to separate from our kids to go on travel and, you know, have to stop them, interrupt them from this, like, you know, but sometimes we're going to just be like, you know what? Whatever I had to do can wait. And so it's finding that balance, but it's beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, it's just I, I, it's like that experience that I had and then thinking through like, you know, my little guy just like wanting <laughs> just, you know, it's it's pretty mind boggling their their ability to remember like tiny, tiny, like step by step situations. You yeah. Know? And then there's also the. Uh, uh, and, uh, oh, yeah. uh, I'm like, spit uh, it out, kid. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, it's painful sometimes. This is, is obviously another great episode where I think there's just like enormous value specifically for, for parents, but even people that are, that are, that are aspiring to be parents, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't have to be a, a parent to necessarily appreciate a podcast like this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a bazillion books out there that sort of help prepare, parents that are not parents yet because you know everybody mm -hmm. is a potential parent no matter right and everybody was parented right right like everybody has to even if you don't have kids you have the experience of your relationship with your parents and if, for example you 
didn't receive something from them and you're still holding on to it, you know, there are ways to unpack that and let go of that and find some peace with that, heal that wound, right? Like, and that's really cool that like, that story that you just told is like pretty moving. The, 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 um, there was something that you said in our last episode that's made a massive impact on me that is not only like giving me a, you know, a little bit deeper of a perspective just in my communication and just uh, general like body language with my kids, mm -hmm. but with like my life. And when you said, you know, our kids, when they're very small babies, they're a meg. Amygdala, amygdala, amygdala is not really able to comp or our, their brains not able to comprehend what we're saying. They're actually oh, their scanning. prefrontal cortex. No, they're scanning. They're scanning oh, yeah. our nervous system. Yes, the amygdala is scanning is for scanning. cues, nonverbal cues. Right, and so for me, that was like I was like, wow, like it's pretty amazing that that's something that actually happens, right? Where they're not what you say is not necessarily going to make an impact on their lives but the the manner in which you approach or the manner in which you walk through the door or the mm -hmm. manner in which you just enter the home is something that is going to make an impact on their lives for sure because that's abs that's the only thing that they're actually able to sort of connect to at that age mm -hmm. and i think that chances are we obviously evolve out of that because we're able to communicate but chances are like i mean evolve out of only that being yes. the the skill set. We that, get a f we get other layers that right. also help us interpret the but, but sure our amygdala is always like, your and mine actively scanning right now. And if I like if some loud noise happened behind us and I totally flinched, you would flinch. Totally. Not even if you didn't hear the noise. So like let's say it wasn't a noise that oh, we yeah, both you, heard, right? Like if right. I flinched with no cue to you that something was going on, my flinching would make you flinch, right? Because we're your amygdala would see my my threat response mm. and it would cue up a threat response. Like we're always, we are interconnected human beings. Like as a species, we use these cues to know how safe or dangerous the environment is. It just, it just made such a, such a, um, <laughs> it just made such an impact on me because I really started to be way more mindful mm -hmm. and cognizant of like, how am I walking into a room? Mm -hmm. How am I walking into the house? How am I, literally like getting out of the car right mm -hmm. if i'm meeting people and i potentially people are you know i think that that it's it's i've just been like my entrances and my exits i've been more cognizant of understanding and, and appreciating that like it's not always what i say mm -hmm. but really just how i'm like conducting on the inside right the inside job yeah. that that is 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 actually portrayed um, that we don't necessarily appreciate. So if anybody listened to that episode, if you haven't listened to the first episode, you should definitely do it because it was equally as good as this one. But I pulled some value out of that that was far beyond like just being a parent, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I appreciate that. I really do. You know, the la the, the, the time that I, that I really actually was like very mindful of it was most recently... I hunt. Some people are going to have a problem with that. Whatever. It's what I do. I love to do it. And so hunting season is now. Mm -hmm. And there's no other, like, hunting is, like, you are, you have to be a stealth. Like yeah. Stealth. Yeah. And, and typically when you hunt, like, especially if you hunt in the morning, you know, you're not allowed to engage anything until... 30 minutes before sunrise. So you want to be like well established before that period of time. Mm -hmm. So like you crawl into your spot. For me, it's like an hour before, a half an hour before sunrise. So I'm just like totally, I am as quiet as a mouse. And I like, I meditate and I get into this place where I'm like, I am not going to show, my nervous system is going to be so relaxed mm -hmm. that if there's anything in my zone, there's going to be no sign of, of tension, you know? Yeah. And it's, and literally, I'm not even joking, that that is how I've been like thinking about 
this totally the CN, you know, the, like the nervous system and how it can really sort of make waves. Yeah. And like, I'm not particularly woo woo either, but I do believe like with the breath work thing and like I've done Reiki and had kind of a similar experience to what you were describing and not quite as intense, but like huge energetic release that I was like, what the heck was I holding that I felt that come out? Like energy is very real. Like it just is. And there are ways that I think we underestimate the importance of regulating our energy. And it's true for parenting, it's true for life, it's true for hunting, because if you think about what you're doing, you're reconnecting to like nature and animals are really tuned in to energy, mm. you know? So yeah, if you need to be invisible in nature, you better blend in, you better not be emanating a bunch of nervous energy. And like, cause I imagine that's going to, I don't know the, you know, Spook them. Yeah, it's going to spook them. It I don't does. like the physics of it and all. And literally, but yeah. it's, it's as much as your heartbeat. It's as much as literally like your heart rate increasing in an environment like that can completely spook a deer. It's bizarre. Right. It's not like I guess I think it keeps me going back to like if you were, uh, I don't know, a panther, you would be doing this, right? <laughs> And that's the ecosystem you're entering into, mm -hmm. right? Like this is the, I think we've moved so far away from our like innate animalistic, like human, yeah. you know, like natural uh, connection to our energies and our body and our, like these are things that, you know, our modern day society is just kind of trained out, trained us out of, but mm -hmm. it's all, that's our core. That's like who we, that's where we came from. Yes, yes. We kind of went off on a little bit of a, of a derail here, but I think it's all connected. And mm -hmm. I am so grateful for you making the time for me again on the podcast. I'm so glad to be here. I like, like, I, I, like I knew that this podcast was going to be great, but just the flow and just how comfortable it is and, and, and being able to like walk away with some like, for me, selfishly, for sure. But I think the topics that we, that we're covering here are, are not uncommon, you know, and mm -hmm. people really can. Not enough people in in a general way are pursuing content on best parenting practices, mm -hmm. you know? Like, they're not. I don't know many parents that are, like, looking, you know, for interesting ways to assess, like, potential, you know, best practices right? you should come into my world more because i know so many parents like i'm so i, I mean obviously i have a self-selecting group of people in my like world but i'm amazed by how many parents really are interested and like are actively totally pursuing this it might be more moms than dads but you know i think i have like if i go on like my instagram data it's like 94 percent women and four or six percent you know men, what you know what the truth is that was such a like a like a broad generalization that i just made it's pro the truth I, I would imagine that my wife definitely does way more mm. in that arena than i do i would imagine you know i'm i definitely am like the fun dad that just wings it. <laughs> but I just know that I want to love the hell out of my kids. Yeah. You know, I want to love the hell out of my kids. I want them to be stoked all the time. And I obviously create adversity for them. You know, I make them do squats and deadlifts <laughs> and all sorts of crazy shit that they, you know, kind of love doing. Um, but, you know, I just, it's fun to be able to sit down with you, who's like a real expert and professional in the field, and bounce ideas off of you that, like, I don't know where I would find the answers for if I didn't know you well i'm super glad to answer those questions i love <laughs> it i love talking with you it's fun where can we find you so you can go to dr sarah bren on instagram or like dr .com, and then i have a podcast securely attached which you should probably come on i'd love to do that that would be fun we should do an episode yeah and you you also have a bunch of opportunities for people to work with you both in person and online right? yeah i have so i have a group practice in pelham new york but we you know, work with families virtually, um, nationally for parent coaching, but also for therapy in New York State, and then and in person in our office in Pelham. And then we, um, I also have some courses like on tantrums, and I have a parenting, you know, eight week coaching program. So there's lots of ways that we can work together. Sweet. 
Guys and gals, boys and girls, people of all ages, sizes and shapes. Another good episode that just made me feel so warm and cozy. And I know that this episode is going to be in January most likely. So it is a new year and it is a time to not only reflect, not only think about what we did for the last 12 months, but also potentially throw our flag in the ground on a couple of things that we kind of want to do. And I'm not like a big uh, New Year's resolution person necessarily, but, you know, I think these podcasts give us an opportunity to think about some things that we could potentially be doing better. The whole purpose of this is to share some value, share some, some knowledge from experts in ways that we could, you know, think about what we, what we do and what we've done and maybe like make a little shift, you know, make a little shift. I think the number one thing that I heard on the podcast today was phone away. Mm -hmm. You want to connect with your kid alone um, on a, on an awesome dad son trip. Don't take your phone with you, man. You don't need it. You know, the phone is the, is the devil. It really is. You're probably listening to this on your phone right now. So <laughs> I like it a little bit, but you know, I would argue to say that, uh, you know, that's a big one. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Sarah Brent for coming on the podcast for the second time. And, I'm, and there's going to be more. If you enjoyed this podcast and, uh, you know, you, you have, you know, you think that you got value, please share it with a friend, share it with a family member, share it with your wife or your husband or boyfriend or girlfriend, um, share it with anybody who you think will really appreciate it as much as I know I certainly did. And I'm hoping you did. It would mean the world to me if you did that. Also, you know, I'm going to ask for a review and a rating. That's just kind of how we keep the podcast afloat. That's how we get it in. in uh, that's how it ranks. If you guys give us a five star review and a, a five star rating and a review would be amazing. If you're not going to give me a five star rating, <laughs> don't give me one. <laughs> I'm joking. Tell me, tell me how you tell me how you feel about the podcast. It, it, do, it does really help. And, uh, you know, I hope everybody had awesome holidays and I hope that this new year is the best ever. This is going to be the year for you. I promise. Keep listening to the Creature Habit podcast. Keep eating meal one. Keep using nightcap. And, uh, you know, I love you and I appreciate you. Until the next one, y'all. Peace. <laughs>